Cool. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, so you've probably seen on the uh, Facebook group, but the Botany Society has just bought this new, I'll show it to you all, uh, digital microscope. Um, and yeah, I've been playing around with it and it's really cool. I didn't even know this existed until Ali Kello um, told us about them. So yeah, it's really cool. Um, yeah, so I'm going to have a bit of a closer look at Asteraceae. Um, all right. I just prepared a little... Can you see that full screen? Yep, cool. Um, yeah, just prepared a little intro. Um, so we're just going to have a look at the family and then go through some of the morphology and the terminology because Asteraceae, uh, the family, has a whole suite of um, terms that are pretty much unique to the family. Um, so when you're going through a key, it can be really sort of like daunting because every second word, you know, is kind of new. Um, and then we'll kind of, when I wrote this, I was thinking maybe we'll do the terms and then we'll do like a dissection, but I think we'll kind of look at some terms and then uh, do a dissection at the same time, if I can figure that out with a split screen something. Okay, so yeah, they're the largest flowering plant family in the world. Um, they're found in every continent except for Antarctica. Um, there's yeah uh a lot of them um so yeah they're a bit of a daunting family uh to get stuck into but um yeah they're really really cool and functionally important so important for all the bees and um insects um they're not the biggest family uh in australia i think um the fabaceae and the poaceae um beat them in number of uh, genera and species, uh, but they're still up there and one of the biggest. Um, and they pretty much grow in ev every environment. So um, wherever you go, you'll see them. Um, so they're most common in Australia, in the grasslands, those grassy woodland ecosystems, and those same two ecosystems in the alpine environments as well. Um, they're less common in the sort of rainforests and damp, uh, you know, uh, damp forests, but uh, they still occur there. Um, okay, so just some of the uh, asters that you would see probably every day. Uh, the lettuce in your garden is a daisy. Artichokes are a daisy. Uh, that string of uh, pearls that you might have in your bathroom is a daisy. And of course, um, the dandelion that's everywhere flowering on everybody's lawns at the moment is also a daisy. Um, so they're mostly forbs. So that is a, a non-woody, um, non-grass, um, so small plants, what you'd think of as a typical daisy, um, but they can also be large trees. So um, Bedfordia arborescens, uh, that grows in sort of the damp uh, forests, like down in the Otways and in the high sort of um, highlands. Um, and that can, you know, that's like a eight, eight metre tree. Um, a similar Illyria argophylla, that's also like a, a 10 metre tree. Um, and they can also, on the other spectrum of things, they can be really, really tiny. So, um, you know, the Melotia tenufolia, that's like a couple of centimetres um, tall and same, um, same with uh, this Actinobly, uh, which I haven't seen yet. I'd love to see one of these. Um, yeah, really, really tiny. Okay, so that's the intro to the family. Um, so now the um, 
the common sort of morphology of all asters is they have a capitulum and this is an inflorescence so an inflorescence is a term that um, you'll see a lot in botany and it means that it's a compound uh, flower head so many flowers individual flowers uh, made up into a flower head um, but in Asteraceae it has its own name of a capitulum uh, because uh, it has a few unique features so all the flowers uh, sit on a receptacle um, and that receptacle and those flowers are um, kind of surrounded by uh, the involucre which is um, a whole it might yeah a whole bunch of bracts um, okay so she may be sorry about the dog barking um, I'm gonna just see if I can share the is that sharing two screens or just the um microscope two just screens? the microscope oh just the microscope okay okay well that's fine okay so da, 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 maybe we'll look at this one Okay, let's, let's show it a little bit. Um, but this is your uh, sort of typical capitulum. So you've got uh, this, uh, so florets on the inside, and then um, they're surrounded by, oh, I'll just focus that, the involucral bracts, which are those green bits. Um, Bit nicer example of those involucral bracts uh, on this rhodanthe. Um, so they're quite papery, these ones. Um, and inside there is our florets. And we'll just chop that in half. And there you can see them all all those individual florets sitting on that receptacle. Um, yeah. Okay, so. Is that back to, hopefully that's back to the slideshow. Okay. Okay, so there's a bunch of different florets and um, Asteraceae florets are somewhat unique in that they're, they're different to a regular sort of flower um, in the way that uh, your typical flower, the things that stick out are the anthers. Um, like think like uh, the blossoms on your street at the moment, all the anthers are sticking out and the anthers are the male, the male parts uh, that have the pollen. Um, in daisies, the anthers, which are typically, there's typically five, are fused all together facing inwards um, in a, a ring in a tube I should say um, and they typically sit within the corolla um, and um, yeah and and all of the anthers are facing in so the way that they get their pollen out is the style which is the female part when that matures it pushes its way up through that uh, anther tube and presents that pollen. Uh, but we'll have a bit of a closer look at that uh, in a minute. Um, and so you've got your petals, which make up the corolla. Um, 
and then you've got your your calyx which is your sepals and they're modified into a pappus um, so in a typical flower you have um, you know one row of petals and then you've got beneath that a row of sepals um, but in Asteraceae, these have been highly modified into pappus and there we'll have, yeah, better look at these later, but they're used for like dispersal mostly. Ah, uh, yes. Now I just wanted to chuck this slide in. Um, we're mainly going to just look at the disc florets, the ligulate florets and the ray florets, but there are a bunch of others. Um, I only uh, kind of heard of this blabiate one the other day. Um, I haven't actually seen that before. Um, and yeah, there's a few other ones of filiform and ones that are uh, without the anthers as well. Okay, so disc florets are. They have a, they're also called tubular florets, and they have the petals um, in a tube, basically, around those anthers and, that, um, and the stamen. Um, so, might see if we can have a look at one. Just bear with me. Haven't done a, a live dissection before. Okay. Okay. So it's a little bit tricky to see because the uh, the styles are sticking out there and kind of covering that petal tube. Um, but these are the petals, and they form a tube. So that's our our disc floret or our tubular floret. Both those words are just used interchangeably. Um, come back here. And just because this is a nice example, um, you can see those two recurved arms there. That's our, our styles uh, that have cur curled back. Um, okay. Oh yeah, just while we're here, the um, the seed on a in a daisy, um, and also in other families, but um, it's referred to as a sipsilla, um, or an akene. And they have um, slight technical sort of uh, differences, but those words are kind of used interchangeably in the keys and just wherever you're reading. Um, yeah, some people say sipsilla, some people say akene, uh, but that's referring to that seed. Okay, the other kind of floret that we're going to look at is a liculate floret. And so instead of those petals forming a tube around the anthers and the style, um, they're all fused together into a long um, arm, which is called a ligule. And so that's where the ligulate floret gets its name. Um, this is also a little bit confusing. I got really confused when I was doing uh, second year botany. Um, difference between like a, a ligulate floret and a ray floret because a lot of texts kind of use them interchangeably um, but technically a ligulate floret has five the 
five petals, oops, um, it's five lobed. Um, so I'm actually just going to skip ahead here. Um, so these are ligulate florets and you can see those five um, ends of those petals um, there. So that's how you can tell that's definitely a, a ligulate floret. Um, a ray floret is three lobed at the end and the other two petals have just reduced so much that you can't see them anymore. Um, so get one of those for us to look at. Okay. Um, Oops. Okay, so this is our ligulate floret. Um, this is off your common dandelion. Um, and so you've got now let's see if maybe we can see those five ends there. Yeah. It's very tiny. Let's zoom in a bit. Okay, so yeah, there's five five lobes at the end of that um, ligule. Oh. All right. Um, okay, so the anthers on this floret are here. So that's the that's the anther tube, and this is the style that's been pushed up through that and then opened up there. And these these fluffy bits here, that's the pappus, and the the sipsil has fallen off that one. Okay. Um, while we're here, I'll just show you a ray floret just because they basically look exactly the same. Um, but they have that three. Oops. Okay, so this is a ray floret. Oh, good. Let's see if we can see that, those three petals. Oh, no, I'm just butchering it. Anyway, it should have uh, three fused petals at the back there. Um, and this one's actually, um, so a female flower, it's missing that anther tube. Um, and this is a fertile one because it's got that sipsilla on the bottom. So this, um, this style would still be receptive to pollen. Um, and so this can be pollinated and form a seed, uh, but it's just missing that anther um anther tube so that's sometimes a, a characteristic in a key uh, whether the outside florets are uh, female or if they're heterosexual okay okay so now just talk about so those all of those florets um, sitting on the receptacle uh, can form different combinations and they um, uh, those different combinations are called different things and that can be a useful uh, useful character in the keys um, so if they're all disc florets then you will have a discoid head so um, typical like billy buttons, they're a, a discoid head. Um, 
I've got here. I've got here da -da, some um, chrysocephalon. Um, and now these are discoid heads. Um, we can chop one open. Actually, wait. And all of the florets will be tubular. So they don't always um, form that sort of globose, uh, globular um, head like a um, Crispedia or a Billy Button. Um, if the if the bracts, the involucral bracts, kind of push them up um, so they're all sitting straight, uh, then they can kind of uh, form this bell-shaped look. Um, oh, it's a little bit messy. Um, but yeah, they're all going a little bit. They're all tubular florets, um, so they don't have that legal arm. Um, you can see some of those ones on the edge there um, are open. Okay. And while we're here, maybe we'll have a look at the, the involucral bracts on the chrysocephalon because they're quite nice. Okay, so they're really like, um, there's multiple layers of them. So um, some daisies will just have one layer of involucral bracts. They're also called, yeah, this is just a thing that happens a lot. There's often like two names for things. Um, and they're also called phyleries um, or involucral bracts. I've noticed in our keys, uh, like the Australian ones, they're kind of, yeah, they're called involucral bracts. Um, but yeah, you'll see phyleries as well. So an individual one, that would be a phylary. Um, so they're quite feathery on the edges. All right. Um, the next one is a ligulate head. So if you've got the whole uh, capitulum uh, made up of ligulate florets, um, so the Myrnong, the Microceros, that's a ligulate head. Um, the, um, the dandelion, that's also a ligulate head. So, oh, wait, there we go, that one there. Um, and a radiate head uh, is the other type. So that's a combination of the two, having the lig or technically ray florets on the outside with those uh, the three uh, the three lobes, and disc florets in the centre. Um, now there's also one other kind of head and that's called a disky form um, but I don't have any examples of that so I'm not really going to cover it but it's got um, it's like a discoid head but it's got um, filiform florets in it as well so I'm gonna after this I'm gonna share a few um, uh, free to download PDFs that kind of go over this stuff in a bit more detail as well Okay, so have a bit of a look at some pappus. Uh, so I just got a flowering dandelion because that's the classic and it's everywhere. Um, oh, actually, first of all, yeah, so the pappus is, as I said before, um, it's the sepals that have been highly modified, so highly modified um yeah sepals and they're mainly the purpose of it is for seed dispersal so um 
they can be caught up in the wind and travel on the wind, um, which can be really, really effective where I'm working at the moment. Um, there's a lot of, um, is it the artichoke thistle? And the seed of that just, you know, get a, well, like the strong winds today and the seed was just blowing everywhere. Um, or you can have the pappus sort of modified um, like this biddens uh, on this biddens species here um, and they're they're backwards facing barbs and they'll you know catch on to animal fur and stuff like that um, or if the species you know if if the plant if it's an mal like maladaptive to blow a long distance, maybe the pathos will also be reduced to really small scales and not be functional uh, for movement at all. Um, okay, so let's have a look at some. Uh, so this is the pappus of, uh, now let's see if we can zoom out, this is zoom out super far. Uh, there we go. So this is the dandelion seed. Um, so I've got the cypsilla at the base. Uh, we've got this elongated uh, tube and that really fluffy pappus of bristles, I think the term is. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay. So let's see if we can get a bit closer. Ooh. Yeah, so just super fine hairs. Um, sometimes they'll just be like simple hairs. Um, sometimes they'll have kind of, they'll be like feather-like. I think I've got an example of that. Um, Okay, so you can see on each of those sort of, okay, let's go a bit closer, if we can. Okay, that's as close as I can get. Um, on each of those kind of pappus hairs, there's extra hairs. So, um, yeah, I'm not super all over the different terms for the different pappus. Um, I often just go to the dictionary when they come up in the keys. Um, but yeah, there can be a lot of detail in the pappus. Um, so that's one. Oh, now, um, I think it was Julia that mentioned in the Facebook group, having a look at some of the different seeds. So there's definitely, um, definitely variation in character characters within the seed. So this one, I'm not actually sure if this seed is completely fertile because um, it does look a bit sort of depressed. Um, but this one's quite sort of shiny, whereas we'll have a look at a few others. And they're, they're definitely different for the different um, kind of genera. I'm not sure if there'd be differences in, well, I'm sure there would be differences in species, but for like sort of fossilized records, I don't know how much um, details retained. Um, so this is a, this is a xerochrysum, a paper daisy. Um, and again, on that seed, it's kind of shiny. And again, on those pappus, they're kind of multi, sort of feather-like. Um, they've got little little burrs coming off, um, but they're so soft burrs uh, coming off each each pappus. Um, but that's actually a different a different um, genera to the last one. The last one we're looking at was Podolepus. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you'd be able to tell 
difference between those um, without knowing that the xeroprism has a yellow pappus. Uh, now this is Salmisia. And you can see this Cypsilla is quite different. So that's got quite distinct kind of furrows on the, on the seed and it's quite hairy along, along it, um, which the others didn't have. Um, similar pappus again for all of those. Um, we'll just have a look at one more. Because I think this one's a bit different. Oh no, oops, I just broke it. These are so tiny by the way. Okay, let's have a look at this one. So this is a Crospedia, and this one's super fluffy. Um, just see if I can flip it over. Really sort of, this would be called plumose, which is like feather-like. Um, so yeah, really delicate, really fluffy. This would be easily sort of caught by the wind. Um, yeah, kind of a lot more like secondary branching in that pappus compared to the, oops, I've just sent it well away. Um, secondary branching in that compared to the other, other species. Um, and that seed is also covered in really tiny sort of oppressed hairs, which just means they're sort of pressed up against the, the seed. So that, yeah, that's quite nice. Okay, um, I think the only other thing I wanted to show you guys was actually this Illyria. Um, oh, we've got a bug on there. <laughs> um, this has a really nice example of the anther tube. So, might not need to dig one out, um, but you can see see that brown is the anther tube, and sticking out of it is those that forked style. So there can also be variation uh, within the morphology of the styles. Um, there's a whole bunch of different types of those. Some of them have sort of little appendages on them. Um, some of them don't, but all of them have sort of uh, kind of bristles on the outside so that when they come up through that anther tube, they kind of like scrape the pollen. Um, and so, okay. Let's just have a, have a little look at that bug, if anyone knows what it is let us know um, i'm hopeless with bugs um yeah i might try and just get a nice example of the different stages of pollen presentations just give me one second Also, if anyone has any questions, feel free to just uh, ask them at any point. Or if you want to like look at something in more detail, Did you just have all these native daisies growing in your yard, Nina? 
Uh, so they're actually um, down at Rosanna Station, which is just close to my house. There's a really nice, um, yeah, they've, they've put a whole bunch of natives in, which was so lucky because I have nothing growing in my yard except a few, um, a few dandelions. Yeah, right. So, yeah, that was fortunate. <laughs> Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have done a daisy workshop. Um, okay, just trying to get the different stages of the secondary pollen presentation because this is pretty, um, I mean, other families do secondary pollen presentation, um, but the way that Asteraceae does it is quite um, cool. Sorry, these are all so tiny. Slightly bigger ones to work with. Okay, maybe we'll have a look at this one first. So, okay, so that is a disc for it. Um, the anther tube is kind of hidden in there. Actually, this is a bit hard because they're all the same colour, but that anther tube is just there. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, um, but it's just in that fork of those two petals. And then that's the style that's poking up through there. And because, oh, another bug. Um, because the pollen is the same color, it's kind of hard to see, but that, because those, style arms are still together that'll be in the male phase so presenting the pollen to a pollinator um, but those uh, the receptive surface of this floret which is on the inside of those arms um, is not sort of available so it's basically doing this to stop self-fertilization and making sure that pollen gets transported to another uh, floret or another uh, flower head completely um, and it's not um, it's not taking its own pollen um, and then actually The other day when I was looking at these, these were absolutely covered in pollen. So, aha, there we go. Ah, stuck to my finger. All right. So this is a prime example of presenting the pollen on the outside of, okay, here we go. Um, the outside of that style. So the base of this, that's the anther tube. And then the style is pushed through that, uh, basically collecting, let's get a little bit closer. Um, uh, yep, collecting pollen uh, all the way up it. And then, so this is just coming out of the male phase and that uh, the inside surface of that style um, is, uh, the receptive surface. So this is just beginning uh, the female phase. So I'll see if I can just get one that's a bit further into the female phase. Ah. There we go. So, um, yeah, and they sort of curve back like that. I guess uh, the idea is that they're trying to avoid getting um, their own pollen onto that receptor surface and then that's kind of available, that surface is available for when, uh, you know, a little bug walks around and drops off pollen from another flower. 
uh, not a floret. Um, yeah, that's kind of all I was going to talk about. Um, oh, another thing I'll just talk about briefly. Um, if you watch that video I sent in the in the um, in the event, um, Joey talked about it, but it's the way the the florets mature in a in a um, capitulum. So this is uh, Coronidium scorpioides, and so the florets on the outside um, of that head will mature first, and then as they go in, so the ones in the centre here, like this, uh, they haven't even opened yet. Um, so yeah, they'll, is it, I think it was called centripetal maturation. Um, and so yeah, they'll, they'll mature from the outside in, and that's another mechanism to try and avoid um, crossing your own pollen. So and trying to get the pollinators to move, you know, if they land on your floret here and they've got new pollen and then as they go around, you'll kind of have pollen from different flowers and then as they leave, you know, there might be a bit of uh, self-pollination, but uh, trying to minimise it. Um, yeah. And, oh, just one more. Thing as well another character um, this uh, this is from this brachyscone so that's this purple uh, purple one here that we were looking at before that has one um, one ring uh, on its uh, of its involucral bracts um, and then on the actual capitulum, so they're the mature seeds there, on the actual capitulum, uh, you can have bracts as well. So they're called, one name of them is receptacle bracts. There's another name, I've just forgotten it. Um, uh, but those, a bit hard to see, but those little, things there, that's um, a bract. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's basically what I wanted to share with you. The, they're kind of, yeah, the main uh, floret types. You'll come across the main um, sort of capitulum head types. Um, and yeah, I guess if there's any questions, far away. Um, I've got no questions, but I just wanted to say thank you. It was good to have a bit of a rehash on Asteraceae. I um, did botany last year and really found it confusing, so it was kind of nice to have a bit of a refresher. <laughs> no worries, yeah. Yeah, it was even, it was a refresher for me, like uh, putting all this together, which was great. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Did you say you've got PDFs? you're going to yeah yeah I'll put them in the um either on the event or just in the in the botany you know just make a post um yeah. there's one volume the flora of Australia there's uh three volumes for Asteraceae volume one is you can download for free um unfortunately they're mostly the weedy species um but it's got, um, yeah, it's got quite a good introduction, a uh, bit of information. And then there's another one um, that kind of has those, all those terms and those diagrams that I used. Uh, and another, which I haven't read yet, but it goes in, it's, it's huge and it goes into all the evolution and a lot more other stuff. And they're all free, so I'll 
yeah, I'll put them up. It's pretty cool. Any requests for uh, if people want to do this again? <laughs> Yeah, you got the microscope, so it'll be fun to explore some other families. Yeah. Maybe other flowering. Yeah, I was thinking like really tiny flowers that are just super hard to see, just generally. This could be super useful for like the uh, salt bushes Ooh. and um, exocarpus. Mm. That's like absolutely minuscule flowers. Um, I was thinking there's also, we could return to Fabaceae and just look at the Faboidae subfamily. Yeah, yeah. Because um, there's a few flowering in that at the moment. True, yeah. The um, Hardenberg here and, and that. Yeah, I'd be keen for that. Are you going to run that one, Hayley? Um, yeah, I think so. Unless someone else wants to do it, you're more than welcome. <laughs> um, I could, um, if you could let me know what ones you're going to talk about and then I can have them to show like up a bit closer on the Oh yeah. Um, show. Cool. Yeah. I haven't heard back from Nature Advisory. So it'll either be Nature Advisory or a Faboidy talk next week. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nina. That was a really great refresher. Oh, thank you. Yep, thank right. you so much. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, Richard. All right. Oh, maybe I'll sign off. Yeah. Okay. Have a good day. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye.